But let's dive in. So first, the reason why we did this, um, Nikki Gumbel, who's the pioneer of Alpha, during the COVID pandemic basically said globally, this is the most evangelistic moment of our lifetime, like the most epic moment and in a very British voice. That was terrible, but you get it. And I was just like, really? Are you sure? You know? And so I was basically thinking to myself, is he like Nikki gumbling us or is this for real? You know? And we, so we decided to ask Barna, hey, study with us Gen Z, ages 13 to 18. That's what we did. I know Gen Z goes all the way up to 25, 26 right now and all the way as young as like 10 or 11. And the generation after that is Gen Alpha. That's not, I don't know why, but it's Gen Alpha. I think just back to the beginning of the alphabet. So we said, hey, let's study ages 13 to 18. And then uh, during the pandemic and evangelism and what they as Gen Z want, what's, what's appealing to them. Are they participating in this? Are they open to this? And what we found out together is that it is the most radically open moment for us to share the good news of Jesus. Um, in fact, Barna is doing a global study and we're calling this global study the open generation. That's what Gen Z is, the open generation. So we'll unpack things for you as we go through this study. But I know that right now, many of you here probably know grandkids or maybe you know your own kids who have drifted away from the church. And that's probably why you're here. It's like, what do we need to do? And we'll kind of talk about this and unpack it a little bit and throw it to conversations. But I want you to know that there's hope. Um, even I live in Holland, Michigan. I got four kids. Ten, yeah, I know, wow, that's a lot. It is a lot. 10, 10, 8, and 6. So we had twins from the get-go. That was crazy. Uh, but in Holland, Michigan, during the COVID pandemic, um, I was at another gathering called the Multi Summit in Indiana, and one of the pastors from Holland, Michigan came up to me. And he said, I need to talk to you. And I was like, great, yeah, what's going on? And I was talking about how young people really do, they're hungry for the Holy Spirit. And he pulls me aside and he says, I need to talk to you about something. And he goes, during the pandemic, like five kids came up to me and said, hey, we just want to go and continue to like be together and worship the Lord and seek the Lord together. And I was like, and he, and he said, you can't because the pandemic, we literally can't open the doors. And the kids, the high school students were like, oh, that's okay. We'll just go to the woods. I got lots of woods next to me. Like go to the woods. And so they went to the woods and five kids eventually turned into 400 kids going to the woods, worshiping the Lord together, seeking after the Lord. And they Instagram lived it like any good quality Gen Z would do. And, and as we're Instagram living it, I see them filling up a feeding trough for cows. I think it was cows, whatever, horses, something. And they filled up with water and they started baptizing their friends who have saying yes to Jesus out in the woods. And the whole church was like, what do we do? <laughs> and I was like, is it of the Lord? And they were like, yeah. And I was like, get behind it. Don't try to control it. Get behind it. And that's something you have to know. The Lord is on the move at Gen Z. I feel like the beaver on Chronicles of Narnia, you know, gathering around and saying like, Azan's on the move, you know, like God is on the move with Gen Z. And the data that we're surfacing for you, I think will be helpful for you to figure out how can I participate with the work the Holy Spirit is already doing and say yes to the generation that God is saying yes to. Does that make sense? In fact, evangelism is partnering with the work the Holy Spirit is already doing. And that's what we're just going to unpack together. Okay. That's long enough an intro. So the first thing I want to do actually is um, open up to you guys to have the question of what are you longing for? What are you longing for in your ministry, maybe for your personal life, your family life? And what I'd love is the pictures on the table in front of you are there to help you um, talk about what you're longing for. So on the Alpha Youth series, this is cool like a pool picture where you can begin to identify where you are in the faith journey. And it's really helpful for young people. And what I found is actually really helpful for everybody. So whatever picture on your table, um, best represents what, what you're longing for in your ministry or your life, use that. And then just explain why. Now, there's so many of you registered, which is awesome. Um, we didn't have enough pictures. So I got other pictures for you. So you can look at the, the screen. And I intentionally picked the crying baby for some of you as well. So there you go. So go ahead and chat amongst yourself for a little bit. The question is, what are you longing for in your ministry? Talk about it. Get to know each other a bit. And identify the picture at your table that best kind of represents that. Make sense? All right, go for it. You got like five, six minutes, and then we'll come back and we'll dive into the data. Well, let's bring it back. How many of you picked the crying baby on the, the screen? 
<laughs> no one. Great. Okay. So give me, give me some shout, out, uh, shout outs. What are you guys longing for? What's the thing you're kind of longing for in your ministry or maybe longing for in your family, longing for just in general in your life? What, maybe, and you can say, hey, someone else at my table said this, if that makes you feel more comfortable, too. <laughs> yeah? I have some commitment. Uh, I use this picture of the decision. A lot of kids are kind of still lukewarm in their faith. Yeah. Uh, even commitment to, hey, kind of come to our band and they can disappear for a while. Just commitment. Sure, them. commitment. Yeah, a resiliency, even. That's good. Yeah? Waterfalls. Of the Holy waterfalls. There we go. Um, was there a waterfall picture at your table? Oh, there you go. I mean, that's like just teed you up perfectly for that moment. <laughs> All right. Anybody else? We'll just do one more. Longing for. What are you longing for in your ministry? Yeah. Go ahead. Deep, deeper roots. And did you go with the tree one up there? Obviously. There you go. Obviously. There it is. That's what I was waiting for. Love it. Well. My friends, um, as we kind of keep going into this, you use those pictures to kind of like illustrate some things for you guys and talk about it and keep asking the questions why and keep leaning into each other, discover more about each other because like I said, this moment, we need to lean into each other more than ever. And I love that there's Catholics in this room and I love that there's a whole different version of Protestants in this room. And for my Catholic friends, when I say evangelism, it's basically evangelization. And when I say, talk about like the gospel, it's basically the kerygma stuff. Like, does that make, hopefully that makes sense. You guys probably know that. You'd be like, we know that. Move on. You know, so okay. Um, so here we go. Um, when we kind of go around the country, um, what's helpful is, what we want to do is help define reality. Max Dupree actually says this, the first job of every leader is to define reality. And so I'm going to help define reality. Some of you have probably heard this before, and I'm going to go through it. Um, just to set us up to what's really true happening across the country. So one, we're going to help define reality across the country, and then I'd like to define reality with where you're at, in your congregation, in your parish, or where you're, where you're gathering. The first, you probably heard this before, is that one in two young people will drift, are drifting. Basically, and those are one in two coming from our youth ministries. Uh, one million young people per year across the states are walking away from the faith. And those are not one million young people outside of our groups. They're actually one million young people inside of our groups. I just want to make sure that's clear. Like inside of our youth ministries, a part of the church that would say I was a Christian growing up. They're walking away from the faith. One and two. Scott Kermode says this. He's the director of Hugh Dupree, professor of leadership for Fuller Theological Seminary. The church is calibrated for a world that doesn't exist. And it's very true for young people in Gen Z. Um, but if we, you, for many of you, as you kind of lean into the conversation about Gen Z or even millennials, like this conversation isn't new. It's actually been around for like 30 years. Um, but why hasn't things changed? Like why haven't things shifted? We've been talking about it for a while, but why hasn't it shifted? I'm a part of this collaboration with other different national ministry organizations. Um, Wayne and I, who's back there as well, we're a part of this. And we've kind of agreed collectively that there's, we see really three things surface. The first, we as a church professionalized youth ministry and took the work of youth formation away from the overall congregation and placed it in a youth ministry silo. And if you're lucky, you get a handful of like leaders, maybe some hand-me-down LED lights from the big boy stage, and then maybe sprinkle in some other stuff that the church as a whole doesn't really want anymore. So basically you get, we've separated and segregated ministry with young people to have its own thing as a church. It's basically we built out a micro church inside of a church. The second is professional youth workers feel the pressure to focus on short-term activities and relationships rather than the core of what forms people's long-term faith. I don't even know if I was even able to ask the question as a youth minister, what is it's going to form long-term faith in the life of my young people? It's too busy. I had too many angry mama bears to deal with, you know, like youth ministers get that and no one else would. The third is this. There's a lack of spiritually vibrant adults who have experienced and model a compelling and world shaping faith. Now, these are like the three issues that kind of surface. Um, but what I want to tell you again, like this is just this is true nationally, but there's so much hope. 
there is so much hope because God is doing something among Gen Z very special. And we're going to surface this data for you guys. How many of you, by the way, have heard this before, what I just shared? Some of you? How many of you feel this? Okay, a lot more of you. Okay. Um, so maybe just for a handful of minutes, I'll, let's, well, I'll just put some questions on the screen and we'll go back to your table, table discussions. And it's not going to be for very long. Um, but again, think Pennsylvania, where you're ministering. The questions are, as we embark on our own efforts to form young people's faith, we've got to pause and ask, why do you think so little has changed? So just you know, for you, as you think about it, why do you think so little has changed? The second, is there anything else that you feel like has contributed to why things have not changed? And the third is, on a scale of 1 to 10, how would you say you have been able to change things? And maybe you're a 10. Like, that's awesome. Don't, don't be afraid saying, I'm a 10. I can change anything I want. Like, just share. What are you changing and how are you changing it and what are you seeing? Make sense? So just for a couple minutes, have the conversation and we're going to dive in a little bit more into the data. Make sense? All right, go for it. Well, let's pull back in. And, and by the way, we're recording this and I'm pretty sure Bonnie's going to send this out to you and feel free to leverage this for your own teams, for your own leaders. If you have leaders in youth ministry and if you feel like, oh, this could be great conversations for leader development or your leader huddle before you gather, use it. And then just take these questions, steal them, rip them, say that you made them up on your own if they're good, great. If they're not good, say Jordan made them up, you know. Um, so here's what I want to do. I want to lean in right now into kind of what across America, when we see evangelization or evangelism, thriving in youth ministries. Why is that happening? Where are we seeing that? And, and there's actually this, this kind of like almost a paradigm or a Venn diagram that I want to show you. And this is just meant to be like kind of like a diagnostic tool. It's not meant to be something that you're supposed to be critical of, your, um, of what's happening, but more of like, hey, where are we? And this is just an observation that we're making across the country. Um, and what really is true is that Gen Z, evangelism is thriving when the churches that emulate and, and show kingdom culture at its best. And I say kingdom culture, the kingdom of God, like Jesus' kingdom, he came to usher and bring. When, there is, when that's present, young people can't help themselves but invite their friends to come. And what it really looks a lot like a uh, woman at the well, when she encountered Jesus, and then she ran and she just was talking to all uh, the people in her town and said, just come see him for yourself. That's what we actually see with Gen Z. They get so excited about Jesus, they just can't help themselves but invite their friends. They're actually evangelists at heart. Sometimes they're just evangelists for the different stuff, you know. But when they encounter Jesus, they get so excited about him. They realize he brings life to the full. He's what we're looking for. And they invite all their friends to come and journey together with him. So, this is what we see, and, and like, what curates kingdom culture? Like, let's have that quick conversation. Um, again, this is just for you to kind of like, a uh, little bit of a diagnostic of where you are at um, in your congregation, in your parish, your, your, or your gathering. The first kind of component is the idea of life on mission. Um, this is the lifestyle of go. Embedded into what your congregation, the culture, is this like love for your neighbor that compels you to have to go and share with people, share life with people. It's not weaponizing the gospel, but it's like let's share life with people in such a way that they can, they're compelled by the love of Jesus to enter in. The second component is the idea of disciple making, where there's a culture of hear and obey. How are we helping young people hear from the Lord and obey? And the third is this culture of walking in naturally supernatural ways. Let me explain this, because I grew up Baptist, so this is not, you know. For me, um, this was something that I've learned to discover and appreciate. I kind of operate in such a way, for, my, for me, when ministry, that I kind of operated as God the Father, Jesus the Son, and my strategy, you know. And I didn't yet discover the role and the power of the Holy Spirit. And so when I say naturally supernatural, what I really mean is this partnering with the work that the Holy Spirit's already doing. I kind of mentioned that already. And when we see young people being welcomed and operating in the power of the Holy Spirit and the authority of the Holy Spirit, we see evangelism thriving. They can't wait to introduce their friends to Jesus. Um, now, if... Uh, 
if you have all three of these present, and, and, and in a lot of ways all of these are going to be present, but maybe there's not like a great like mixture of it, um, different kind of fruit will kind of like come out. So let's say that you're really great at life on mission and really great at disciple making. This is where I was coming from. What's going to come out is this culture of striving. And you might see that and feel that. You know, how do we get 100 kids to camp kind of thing? Or in my case, how do we get 1,500 students to this retreat that we're going to do? Um, and that was it. It wasn't really no power of the Holy Spirit. It was just like, get kids there, you know? If you have a culture of disciple making and, and really like walking in the natural supernatural, teaching kids like how to walk that way, um, sometimes without the life on mission component, there's this like fruit of selfishness that kind of like grows. Where it's like, well, we're not really compelled by the love of neighbor. We're just going to like, let's just be ourselves and do our thing. And then just let whatever happens, happens. If you're life on mission and naturally supernatural, so the blend of like this uh, deep call to go and then also walk in the power of the Holy Spirit, there's actually this sense of shallowness that may surface. Hopefully this is resonating just a little bit. So what is like the antidote to these things? Like what are the things that are going to help us move away from striving selfish and shallow? If, if you find yourself in a culture where maybe more striving, um, I feel as if the antidote to striving is greater faith. I think one of the obstacles that I encountered when I was growing up and you know, being a youth minister, I was really afraid of losing control. I think we have a tendency to want control and we're really good at controlling things and the flesh is actually pretty powerful. You can do some really powerful things in the flesh, but when you operate in the power of the spirit, it's different. One word from the Lord is just different. It, it resonates and hits in ways that no, yeah, we'll talk more about that in a second. But, but for me, um, to grow in this, I actually had to grow in the ability to make walking in power of the Holy Spirit accessible and desirable for young people. So I needed greater faith. If you find yourself in disciple making, natural, supernatural, and you're selfish, it's actually created a love. Like, ask the Lord to break your heart for the neighbor who's lost, the one that has, you know, just walking away. And if you find yourself in the mixture of, of life on mission and natural supernatural, and you find yourself in a really shallow spot, um, greater hope. So uh, hope, like you guys know, faith, love, hope. Of course, of course I did that, you know. Greater hope. Hope that Jesus is going to accomplish what he said he would. That he is not done and he's not through. So... The good news is, and we're going to get to the data now, is actually what we have found is that young people are starving for kingdom culture. They just don't know it's Jesus' kingdom. And so we're going to unpack some of these things that are like you scratch the surface of kingdom culture, what's underneath that, and we'll kind of unpack that through the data for us here. Um, the first component, this core principle that we're going to talk about is this idea of being real. This is real questions met with authentic living out of your faith. Basically, is the gospel real for you? Is your faith real? Are you going to be open to inviting all these different perspectives to the table? And are you open to living this out? How does your Sunday morning faith make a difference every other day of the week for you? That's what Gen Z is actually calling out. Um, in the data, it says 50% of Christian teens believe that letting your actions speak as a way to explain your faith is an act of evangelism. That's really good news. Because their counterpart... The self-professing non-Christian Gen Z, 55 of them said that allowing a Christian's actions to speak, to explain their faith, is really appealing. So basically they're saying, do you model this? Do you live this? Or are you just going to give me your theological framework? We also discovered that one in two are interested in having faith conversations. We literally asked the question, um, are you interested in learning more about what Christianity could mean for your life? 47% said yes. That's wild. That's awesome. That means that the Holy Spirit is provoking curiosity around the person of Jesus in their hearts without even us like doing something about it. 47%. But what's the disconnect? Why do we see the drift? They told us. If you ask them, they'll tell you. 
They said, I would, would be more interested in Christianity and what it can mean for my life if, 42% said, if the Christians I knew were less judgmental of my beliefs, 37%, 37% said, if the Christians I knew were less judgmental of my lifestyle, and 29% said, if the Christians I knew were welcoming and hospitable. Translate that to, are you listening to me? Are you, will you listen to me? Does Gen Z have a voice at the table? Um, David Augsburger says this, being heard is so close to being loved that for the average person, they're almost indistinguishable. I think from all the data that we're seeing, Gen Z is basically saying, you're not listening to me. You don't hear me. But listening and asking great questions isn't new. This isn't like a new model of ministry. Um, there's this book that, that Mar Martin, oh man, I'm, I butcher his name every time, Coppenhaver. <laughs> if, he's, if he's watching this, I'm sorry. So Jesus asks, he says this, Jesus asks 307 questions. He is asked 183, of which he only directly answers three of them. Some theologians say it's five. It's like, okay, he answers five. The reality is it was asking Jesus and provoking the journey of faith was central to the way in which Jesus did ministry. This is what Gen Z is longing for. Will you journey with me? Can I ask my things? Will you, can I bring these different questions and perspectives? Are you going to judge me for the way that I am? So how do we move forward? Um, our training and our resources should help leaders grow in the skill of being interested, not interesting, and understanding over just being really understood. We're really good at clarifying what we say. I don't know if we're really good at training our leaders on how to listen really well. That's not universalism. I just Gen Z is asking, do you hear me? So attentive listening is not a skill set that's actually natural for us. My wife tells me that all the time, actually. You're, it's, not, it's not a skill set for you. But you have to learn how to grow in the skill set of attentive listening. How do we listen in such a way that a young person feels heard and not listen in such a way that we just hear the, the words they're saying? This, to me, is one of the core things. And honestly, what we could do, uh, really practical for you guys, and then I'll toss it back to you guys, see if you have any ways of, of growing in the skill set. Um, counselors. Professional counselors, they're, they're trained and skilled in how to listen really well. Ask them to come and train you and your whole team in how to listen better. It'll be the best gift that you could give your leadership team. Um, or you know, the, the Connect Deck stuff. That was birthed out of this idea. Young people have a really hard time articulating and they get frustrated because they can't articulate where they're at like, with these deep emotional and you know, conceptual stuff. So throw a picture in front of them and they can resonate with that and they can articulate better. Well, that has come from this idea of like, well, let's listen to young people, help them say what they're trying to say so we can listen better. So use the Connect Deck. Um, invite a, a, a person into your ministry to train you in how to listen really well. So these are just some, some basic, basic, basic ideas. Uh, even this idea of like the way a sixth grader is going to like process through dating it's very different than the way a senior girl is going to process through dating and life. You know, like, how are we listening to the different life stages that a young person is going through? These are things that we have to help our leaders grow in. So, I'll toss it to you guys. Um, maybe you have great ideas of how you are helping as a leader, your different leaders, grow in the skill set of being interested over interesting and understanding over being understood. Does that make sense, by the way? I know it's semantics. I'm trying to take like Andy Stanley's cue about like, hey, make it memorable, you know? If it's not, just blame me, okay? Like it really, if it is, you say you created it. So go ahead and ask that question. How are you doing this? And then what have you found that's worked? What's not worked? Toss that question around for a bit. What's working for Philadelphia? And then, um, then we'll go back into more of the data, okay? All right. You guys ready? Ready to go to the next core principle? Discover more of the data, the good stuff coming from Gen Z. Um, for real, like one of the best things that I've heard from youth ministry they've done, and I did this myself when I was in youth ministry, is I did invite one of the counselors in the area to come in, gave him a really small little stipend and said, please train us on how to listen really well. And at first my leaders were like, I know how to listen, you know? And then they realized, oh, I didn't know how to listen at all. 
And that radically transformed the connectivity of even our groups. So that's something I think, like, if you could put it into practice and repeat, like, hey, just bring in um, listening for whatever reason for young people. We just don't like to listen to young people. I don't know why. I, I think we feel like it's a generation to fix or a problem to solve. And we forget that there are people to love really well. And so we just have to continuously train our leaders how to listen really well, even to young people, especially when they bring up all like that crystal stuff. Is that, is that like your thing here? Yeah. No, some are like, what? You know, some are like, yeah. Does, have you guys heard this whole crystal thing? I mean, that's a... Yeah, okay. Some of you were like, yes. Basically, um, uh, we'll talk about it. I'll, I'll, I'll talk about it in this next section. But... Um, to grow in the skill set of listening is probably one of the best skill sets that we can have as leaders, and it will help in reviving evangelism in your congregation, in your gathering, because young people will feel loved, and they'll start to open up with you about all these different things that are going on, the questions they have. Also, one of the things, too, is you have to train your leaders how not to freak out, okay? So when Crystals does come up, you're, you can't have your leader go, oh my god, like, you have to train them how not to freak out in the moment. And then just like, basically you're saying, wow, that's really interesting. Tell me more. And it's like straight face, you know? <laughs> and it's hard. It really is hard because you, you, you're like, oh, you have no idea like what that leads toward. Um, but when you freak out, so you, if they tell you a piece of their heart that they're afraid to bring to church, like a doubt they have, they're afraid to bring to church or afraid to bring to a gathering or religious leaders or whatever. And all of a sudden they say it. And they're met with a like freak out moment. They're like, "See, I knew it. I'm out. That that I knew you didn't. I knew you weren't going to listen to me like that." And so, training your leaders how not to freak out is going to be a great skill set as well. And counselors, by the way, they hear stuff all the time. Like, they know how not to freak out. Ask them, "How do you not freak out?" They'll tell you. Okay, here we go. Second core principle. So, first core principle is real. The second core principle is this idea of relational. Now, I know if you've been in youth ministry for longer than two months, it's basically you're talking about relational ministry. And it's like, no, I'm not. I'm, I'm talking more about the relational journey which young people go on in conversations around faith. Okay? So, yes, relational ministry is absolutely essential. But what I'm really kind of leaning into is this idea of the relational journey that young people go on. The days of them coming to an event and hearing the gospel, raising their hand, and like, not, those are kind of behind us. Now, does it work? Well, yeah, of course. God can do whatever He wants. But at, at some level right now, students just might not show up. You know, We're going to spend all this energy on pulling something off. They just might not come, might not show up. But what, we, what they will come toward is a relational journey. Um, as I've worked with Barna, we kind of have this like growing hypothesis or conviction. Hypothesis and conviction feel like two very strong words back to back. I don't know... I see this a lot, um, but it's something that I want to like share aloud, and then you guys can like wrestle with this as groups and as, as different cities and towns. But stage one, and that, we put this banana up, because stage one is like furthest away from anyone in relationship to the church. Basically, the last person they knew that was in church was like their friend's friend's friend whose parents got divorced and it was the divorced family. Kind of, that, that kind of like distance, okay? Way, like, why would you go to church? That doesn't make sense. That's weird. No context for it. That's one. Seven is like, I'm ready to live, like hand over my life to Jesus now. Okay, makes sense? That's the spectrum. The questions that ones and twos and threes are asking are very different than the questions that six, sevens, five, six, sevens are asking. Now, that seems kind of obvious, right? A lot of our paradigms in youth ministry currently answer the question, is this real? The questions that one, twos, and threes are asking is not, is this real? They're not asking, is Jesus real? What they're asking is the way of Jesus even good. That's what they're asking. And so they come into our youth ministry programs or our spaces and they're asking the question, is the way of Jesus even good? And we're saying, it's real, it's real, it's real. They're like, I don't care. Like, is it good? So we have to meet them by listening and also facilitating that relational journey through all those different questions. Now, this will make sense as you begin to kind of like unpack that and listen to all the different questions that young people have, but there's actually this tool that I was given, um, and it's so helpful, and it's the six gears of conversation and spiritual conversations. Now, 
We intentionally use a manual car, and I'll get to that in a second. But, yeah, manual car. I know, it's like manual car is like, what's the best way to have anti-theft for millennials and Gen Z? <laughs> manual car, you know? So, I, I don't even know how to drive a manual car, guys. Like, once, I did once, actually, and it was awful. All right, so the first gear in spiritual conversations, gear one, is this casual conversation. This is what's on TikTok. This is, you know, how are the Eagles doing? This is uh, Philadelphia Flyers. Is that you guys here? Yeah, great. So hockey town, it's hockey town, right? All that stuff. Um, Gen Z parks it here very, sh not long, like it's very quick. They quickly go to gear two, and gear two is actually this idea of meaningful. These are hopes, dreams, my family life, things that are going on in my life that you should know about. Like they're very quick to begin to like, open up with their people about stuff. This, for the spiritual conversations, like hopes, it's dreams, it's who I want to be, all that. The next gear is this spiritual conversation. Now this is not necessarily, is Jesus real? Is he, is he who he says he is? Which we meet with C.S. Lewis is like, he's a liar, he's a lunatic, or he's a lord, you know? And it's like, no, they're not there yet. Like, they're actually like, what's crystals all about? What's the spiritual realm all about? I think I'm Wiccan today. Like, oh, I think I'm gonna be Buddhist today. Like all of a sudden they're investigating the spiritual, spirituality. That's what they're doing. They're just kind of like journeying through the spirituality questions. Well, you will see that. Like all of a sudden you're gonna be in conversation and they're gonna start like investigating different spiritual things and, and that just will happen and it's okay. Like that's, they're just genuinely, God is ramping something up in them. He's planting questions in the heart that drive them to question. He's provoking, the Holy Spirit, I think, is provoking curiosity around the person of Jesus, and that's causing him to investigate and ask questions. And that typically looks like, what is, like, is there more to life than this? Like, what's this crystal stuff? Like, what is this Wiccan stuff? Um, the next gear is a decision to follow Jesus. They will find Jesus in the midst of their deep questions, because Jesus will reveal himself to them. The next gear is maturity, growing in their faith, and the next gear is leadership. So why do we use a manual car illustration? Um, this is where it's really important because in the spiritual conversations, um, you have to listen for the questions they're raising, the things that they're talking about, the things that make them like curious and lean in. Um, when you drive a manual car, I hear that you have to listen to the RPMs of the car in order to shift the gears, right? Now, some would be like, yep, that's exactly right. It's like, I've never driven a manual car. I just heard that that's what you do. <laughs> when you are having a spiritual conversation with a young person, you have to listen for the RPMs that's happening in their life and the questions they're raising, and then you know, oh, it's time to shift gears here. It's time to go to the next layer of the conversation. Now, here's the thing. We do not drive up the RPMs. The Holy Spirit drives up the RPMs. We pay attention to what the Holy Spirit's doing and then pay attention to what they're asking. So we pay attention to what the Holy Spirit's saying to us, pay attention to what the Holy Spirit's doing in the life of that young person, identify the RPMs and be like, oh, it's time to shift gears. I'll try it. You know, you shift from spiritual, you're talking about all these things to, hey, have you ever considered Jesus, you know? And then sometimes they'll be like, no, I haven't. I'm, who, how do I know about Jesus? And then you can be like, yeah, well, here's how we can discover who Jesus is. Sometimes you may shift gears and like two to three from meaningful to spiritual. And, they're, and they'll be like, whoa, I'm not, what are you, what are you talking, I'm not going there. You'd be like, oh, that's okay. Just shift gear back down to two. Make sense? Now, in our current ministry model across America, especially with young people, we like to go from gear one to gear four. Casual TikTok, how are the Philadelphia Flyers? Jesus died for you, you know? And what happens when you do that in a car? It stalls. The car stalls, the car literally dies. The relationship with that young person will more than likely die and stall in that moment. It's not gonna go anywhere. So that's why it's helpful to kind of identify, oh, hey, this is like one of those, um, uh, there's probably holes in the metaphor, illustration, whatever you want to call it. But in the moment, we have to know the different gears, the different layers that young people are going through if we're going to enter into the relational journey. Now, here's the cool thing. It's not just you. You know the verse that says, hey, um, I think it was like Apollos planted or Paul planted, Apollos watered, and God causes the growth? You're not the only planter, and you're not the only one watering. 
So a, a student may come up to you and they may full well be in gear three. They're needing you to help them go to gear four. There may, because there's been work done from other people from different spark parts of their life. There are some people who are actually in like gear one that come to you. You're just meant to get them to gear two and three. And then God's going to have someone else come in their life and help them go to gear four. Does that make sense? It's the journey. We have to be willing to create the spaces in our ministries to help young people journey to faith. Um, okay, yeah, hopefully this is a little bit helpful. Now the reverse. I don't have a thing for the reverse yet. <laughs> Maybe it's like, I don't know. It's like, you screwed up, go reverse, you know, okay, I'm not sure. Anyway, you can figure that out. But here's the data. 82% of teens agree that a conversation about faith perspectives are most effective when a significant relationship has already been established. 82%. This is one of the most strongest statements that we got from the data. Basically, they're saying, if there's no trust, I'm not really interested in having the conversation with you. How are we facilitating trust? How are we facilitating relationship? How are we facilitating those conversations where they begin to go through those different layers, the different gears, to ultimately discover who Jesus is? Here's a really cool thing that we found out, and this is one of the biggest pieces that we found out in the data that is different from Gen Z to Millennials. Um, 80% of teens disagree that if someone disagrees with you, it means they're judging you. Basically, they want all perspectives at the table. They're very curious to have everyone's vantage points at the table and discover together, journey together. One of the things that they best want to walk away with is understanding each other. Now, for millennials like me, it's like you're judging me or you disagree with me, you're straight up judging me right now. You know, like it's hard to have conversations with millennials. But with Gen Z, they're like, no, we want everyone's voice at the table. We want to have all the perspectives. So I think for this piece right here, I think exploring disagreement or exploring different vantage points is actually a pathway to better and deeper connection for young people too. Faith conversations are happening all the time with young people. And that's another thing that I, I didn't put this slide deck, but sometimes we think, oh, no one's talking about their faith. They're actually talking about faith a lot, just not at the church, which is really interesting. So if we create environments where they can bring those conversations to a church or maybe to a coffee shop or wherever and facilitate that journey to faith, I think we'll discover that many people will come in droves. Young people will come in droves. Um, in fact, uh, we asked them, it's like, hey, what does it feel like when you talk about your faith identity with someone else of a different faith identity? This is interesting. And it's just Christian to... Muslim or Muslim to Buddha, Buddha, Buddhism or whatever. The top two emotions they felt were calm and peaceful. The bottom two emotions were angry and ashamed. I think that was like, I, I kind of was hearing this and seeing it across the generation. And then the data revealed itself and I was like, oh man, they are having tons of faith conversations already. It's just the church hasn't joined in and how to have the conversation with them. And so that's what we need to do. We need to figure out how do we create a space we can join into the conversation that they're already having and provoke curiosity around the person of Jesus and ultimately show his love to them. So, questions for you. So what have you done that's worked in helping leaders? Oh, that's a bad question because we already did that question. What spaces are you creating to allow students to explore and journey faith in your ongoing ministry? We'll do that one, the second one there. So what spaces have you created to allow students to explore and journey faith in your ongoing ministry. Now, if you, if you know anything about Alpha, of course, this is what Alpha does. But if you don't run Alpha, that's okay. There are lots of other things you could do to do this. If you do run Alpha, that's okay. Talk about it. The idea isn't that you walk away doing Alpha. The idea is we walk away creating the space that young people are asking for. Make sense? Okay, so go ahead and have this conversation with each other. What are you doing to create the space? And then we'll go to some other core principles for you guys. All right, go. All right, let's pull it back in. So um, we do this, uh, we, we're doing this tour called Love Listens Tour with Alpha and we're going around the country. And I was out in New York City, like the heart of New York City with Manhattan and there's this church called uh, C3 over there. And, um, I, and yeah, it's only two and a half hours from you guys. That's wild to me. I'm not from here. So like the, how close you guys are, all these major cities is pretty wild. 
But anyway, I was talking to the youth director there, and they do this thing where it's like, uh, they call it um, youth, youth eat, youth uh, hang, and then youth live. And it's this progression of space where we like, hey, let's just get together, let's hang, let's hang out and eat with each other. And then they get to the progression of like, yeah, we're gonna hang, we're just gonna be intentional about creating space to be with one another. And then they create intentional space, youth live, and that's like your stereotypical youth night that they have. And I'm like, that's amazing, I love that. And in the, in the, center, in the center of Manhattan, like they're doing all sorts of really cool work in youth with uh, New York City. It was like, I think it was, yeah, I think it was that, yeah, youth hang, youth eat, youth live. So anyway, th that's like an example of what I've seen around the country that's like, oh, that's really cool. Like, I love how you're creating these multiple different spaces to intentionally journey with young people, to create that relational space, to journey, with G journey, journey toward Jesus. Um, hopefully you guys are sharing like things that you've seen and things that you've done worked really well for you at your tables. I encourage you guys, if you haven't already, like take each other's like phone numbers and if you're sat with your same church group, maybe find other people you know, afterwards that you can exchange some information to kind of discover some best practices. Because um, I think you guys will uh, find that things that might work for you here could, could also work really well for people within 100 miles of you. Um, I don't know that for sure, for sure, but like I think it probably is gonna have to work really well for you. So be sure to create some space to exchange ideas and try things together. Um, so we've journeyed through these core principles around what is it that's going to revive evangelism um, and how are we helping revive evangelism, particularly among Gen Z. And we've said it's about being real with real questions, um, living out a real authentic faith, uh, relational, creating that relational space. And this next one is actually this idea of reproducibility or reproducible. Another R, imagine that. Real, relational, reproducible. Um, so in the study, another one of those big like, whoa, really strong statement from Gen Z is this. 85% uh, of teens said that they were more confident in their own faith after having a faith conversation with a non-Christian. 65% of them were eager to share their faith again. If I was to translate that, evangelism and discipleship are kind of two sides of the same coin. If we're going to help young people blossom in their faith, we have to equip them, empower them to go have faith conversations with their friends, with like the commissioning of the church saying, go. And um, I think of Jesus when he sent out the 72 disciples and said, hey, you go proclaim the kingdom. You guys know that verse? I'm a bad Protestant. I don't know. What I, I forget. Is it Matthew? Probably Matthew. Something like that. Or maybe Luke. You know, one of those. And, but I remember reading this and, I'm, and thinking about this data and you hear one of those people come back and they say, and they say out loud, Jesus, even the demons fled in your name. You can almost hear like this faith, like it's real, you know? Jesus knew what he was doing. He commissioned them, hey, you go proclaim the kingdom. And um, we need to do the same. We need to commission young people, you go have faith conversations, you proclaim the kingdom to your friends. Uh, there's a really compelling and amazing story coming from the middle of nowhere in Canada called Pincher Creek. Literally, the, um, and it's from Alpha because that's our vantage point. That's our, like, this is what, you know, Bonnie and I, our vantage point to the church is through Alpha. Um, but Pincher Creek, I think the best thing happening in Pincher Creek is a laundromat kind of thing, you know? But wait until you hear what happens. It is incredible and hopefully this will not only rise faith within you but also show you how empowering young people to go have these faith conversations themselves with the construct and all that stuff and your blessing and support is going to cause their faith to explode in good ways not in bad ways good ways here it is Alpha, he told me right away, and I was 
he was like my best friend and I was like, yeah, I'm gonna go to support you. Like even if three kids show up, I wanna go. I printed off um, about three or 400 alpha cards, like little pocket-sized uh, business cards. I went to every single person at school and I handed them a card. It was just personal conversations with the kids and just telling them where the time was and telling them that there was food. <laughs> and people started coming. It was 15 kids showed up the first night, and I was not expecting that. The next week, there was over 20, I think, and it just kept escalating from there. It was a beautiful thing to see. Week four, we had our first first kid get saved. Um, guy my age, known him since grade three. Later that night, I went downstairs and picked up a Bible for him, and I gave it to him, totally forgetting that he could not read. He's got ADD, ADHD, and he has dyslexia. And I look at him, and he's sitting down. He opens, he opens the book up, and he looks down. His eyes widen. It's like you and I have never related to a book in my life. I have never been able to read this. And that night, he read chapter after chapter after chapter. First four weeks, man, it was kind of like, you know, are people actually getting this? What's? Are they absorbing this? And then when he came out, he was able to start reading that book. And when he gave his life to Jesus, oh man, I was like, yes, it's actually happening. People are actually taking this for what it is. And from there on, like every single alpha, it was like something awesome was happening every single night after that point. We were sitting there and a kid... He had been struggling with self-harm and he had all of these scars and I had seen them and like I yeah and we, they were praying and he gets up and he's like guys all of my scars are gone and I'm sitting there I'm like what how did that happen so we were like there was like a few of us a lot of us I guess down in the basement praying and stuff and then in the alpha video earlier, they showed like a girl getting healed from her scar, like self-harm scars and stuff. So I was like, hey, might as well look. And I looked and there was none. And I was like, oh, so it must have been like God loving me that so much that he doesn't want like scars or anything on me. Or any of that. I was afraid of the dark. I was seeing things I couldn't sleep. I was full of, full of anxiety, like I could barely leave my house. I was so stressed out, and I broke down at one point, and I couldn't, I couldn't do it anymore. And Joash prayed for me, like puts his hands on my head, and I actually physically felt all of these things that I'd been feeling leave me. When Dom's scars got healed, I can, I can tell you exactly where he got healed. He got healed right in that spot right there. And Ava, she got released from that fear right in the spot right here. And I can remember every single thing from that night and every single thing that's happened like since then in this place. And it's just powerful down here. So what happened with Alpha, it was like God was saying, Ava, no matter how many times you go back, I'm going to keep coming, I'm going to keep chasing you. No matter what, which was amazing. And it was so crazy because I didn't appreciate that before. Um, but now I really do, and he did it with other teenagers, which I think is crazy in this tiny town. It may start off slow, it may be insanely fast like it was with me, and you'll just see your life be totally transitioned, and your heart will just yearn for him. We're not special um, in terms of why God chose us. It was very simply that he asked him, he said, yeah. So amazing, yeah? That's powerful. Um, this is also happening in the United States everywhere. It's just happening in North America everywhere. And 
What, what we're finding is that when we choose to say yes and give access and authority to young people to go out and proclaim the gospel, God shows up in really powerful ways. It, that's not a unique story. It's happening everywhere. And what I want you to lean into, though, is did you hear him when he said the first four weeks? He's like, man, are they getting this? And they're getting this? And then he's like, and then all of a sudden it happened? And it was like, yes. That's what's happening everywhere. When young people are inviting their friends, and this, again, this is my vantage point's Alpha, okay? So, like, that's, that's what I'm speaking from. When they're inviting the course of Alpha and their friends are coming to faith on Alpha, they get so excited that Jesus is so real and showing up in profound ways in their friends' lives that they just keep running Alpha. <laughs> they just keep doing it. And they keep running it. And they keep inviting more friends. If you go on Instagram, you just throw up Alpha Youth, there's literally Alpha Youth at schools everywhere around the country. And that's not me. Like, that's not the Alpha team. That's students doing it. And their faith is growing because Jesus is becoming real. Remember I told you, like, the whole Beaver or Narnia thing, Aslan's on the move? God's on the move. And God's doing incredible things through young people. So what we need to do as the generation above them is how do we get, is, ask the question, is it of the Lord? And if it is, how do we get behind it? That's it. How do we give away access to authority? How do we encourage them? How do we empower them? How do we be there for them when things go sideways? How do we help them like when a, one of their friends like defriends them? You know, all that stuff. Um, that's what we do. That's what we should do. And when it comes to reviving evangelism in the next generation, we must reproduce this. We must empower them to go and engage the relational journey. I, I made sure to do relational and real first before we did reproducible because we can't just give them the four spiritual laws and say, go do it. You know, because that, that's what not, that they know that's not really going to help their friends. What they want is that space to discuss, to be honest, to journey, to encounter the Lord together and then discover that this is real. And we, it, this, like, this is just one story, guys. I could stand up here telling you hundreds of stories of all that's happening across the country right now. And um, so the question I'm posing to you is, how are you equipping young people to share their faith in that relational space, in that real space? Maybe you've had these amazing events that you've done that really like, was able to encourage young people to go in there. Or maybe you've done this and there was maybe stories of amazing um, things that God did or maybe some challenges that you experienced. Just talk about it with each other and dream up ways that how, you could, how could we do this together as one church together? To say yes to the next generation saying you are God's plan A you know, when it comes to reaching your friends. Like you're it. And to say we're with you, we're for you, we're going to equip you. Or behind you, go for it, and then we just journey with them through that whole thing. So, the question is, how are you equipping young people to share their faith in the ministry that you have? Uh, and honestly, if you're like, I'm not, just say, I'm not, you know, like, I, I don't know how to do it. Or if you are, give examples of, of what has worked really well and what has not worked really well, okay? Another five minutes, and then we're going to land with, we do have a fourth R, we're going to land it, we'll be done by 2.30, and... Um, yeah, and then we'll go, go from there, okay? So a couple more minutes, chat about this, and then we'll uh, land with the last core principle. All right, let's pull it back in. Coming in for the home stretch. So we we'll started the conversation around this idea of like how are we cultivating, uh, reviving evangelism or evangelization among young people, with Gen Z particularly, looking at the data, and the core principles that are surfacing in this idea of being real, relational, reproducible, so real, honest questions, living it out, a true, a true um, a life of a faith that actually shapes your life, relational, engaging the relational journey, uh, like listening to the questions that they actually have and then journeying with them in that, and then reproducible, like powering them to actually have these faith conversations, giving them resources and tools to go and have the conversations. And the last piece, and of course it's another R, is uh, reliant, relying on the Holy Spirit particularly, reliance on the Holy Spirit. So real, relational, reproducible, and reliant. And uh, some of you are like, I knew he was gonna do that. So um, let me talk about reliance on the Holy Spirit. Evangelism, if I was to sum up kind of like what the young people were saying in evangelism, are they open to having faith conversations? 100% yes. 
When they hear the term evangelism, they're like, gah! They kind of have like a knee-jerk reaction because evangelism for that, like for Gen Z is they feel as if it's like, you're just trying to convert me. Don't convert me. And so when I say relying on the Holy Spirit, I've been dripping it the whole time because it's one of the big things that surface is we have to understand again, if we're going to revive evangelism, we have to go back to the roots that evangelism is partnering with the Holy Spirit in the work that he is already doing. The RPMs, you know, all that stuff. Um, we must create cultures of relying on the Holy Spirit and we must help young people rely on the Holy Spirit as well. In fact, if you're trying to reproduce and empower young people to have faith conversations, one of the best things that you can tell them is like, hey, if you, well, this is with Alpha in particular, okay? With Alpha, it's like, hey, you don't know the questions or you don't know the answer to the questions? You're perfect. You know, that's po the point of Alpha is go on Alpha and let's ask questions about this stuff. It's pressures off. The idea is like pressures off of you. You don't have to convert them. That's on the Lord. <laughs> Let the Lord do that. You just have to love them really well. And Gen Z will sign up for that for sure. And then when they see the Holy Spirit show up, they're all in. So when I talk about relying on the Holy Spirit, it's really rooted in this concept of like, it's not on us. We can't weaponize the gospel, go charge hills, plant flags on top of hills and, and all that stuff. You guys know what the language I'm talking about? It's really militaristic kind of language. Is that, you got five? Okay. Some of you are like, I taught that last week. And I was like, <laughs> but we have to, we have to shy away from that. Because that has the undertones and overtones of like, I'm converting you. Um, young people don't want to be converted. They want to be loved. But we know, and now that the intentions are great, because we know the best thing that can happen to them is to encounter Jesus. Yes, and they want that too. But we have to walk with them through that different space. And that looks like relying on the Holy Spirit to do His work. And we're going to be attentive and present to every step of the journey. Relying on the Holy Spirit dials up a ministry of presence, which means more leaders and more time. We have to dial up a ministry of presence, which more leaders and more time, and be willing to journey with young people longer, and not try to convert them, but rely on the Holy Spirit that He's going to do His work. Now, that does not mean that we're shying away from having tough conversations. Of course, we're going to need to have the, those great conversations. But it, um, we have to have this setting, if we're going to revive evangelism, that young people do not want to be converted. They want to discover for themselves the goodness of Jesus. They don't want to be told the goodness of Jesus. They want to discover for themselves the goodness of Jesus. And that looks a lot like just walking with them through all the different spaces. So um, now one of the things that we uh, want to do for you is actually create a space for us to lean into this idea of relying on the Holy Spirit. So we're going to actually be pray we're going to pray right now with you and for you. Um, and then we're just going to wait on the Lord together. And I'll ask Bonnie to do this in a second. But just, just as a kind of frame of reference, we talk about relying on the Holy Spirit. We'll talk about prayer ministry. Like, what's prayer ministry? Now, for I grew up in a non-denominational church, mega church. <laughs> Prayer was a transition to get the artist off stage and for me to start talking, right? <laughs> Let's be real. I never learned how to pray for people. Prayer ministry is a way for us to pray for people. I learned how to pray at people, but I didn't know how to pray for people. And so when we talk about prayer ministry, how do we have a ministry of prayer that saturates our cultures and saturates our ministries to young people? It's very different. Um, and so when we talk about prayer ministry, John Wimber would says, prayer ministry is meeting the needs of others on the basis of God's resources. That sounds really exciting, you know. Um, so part of what we'll do is we'll actually even pray, come Holy Spirit. And for me, when I, when I was hearing this and, you know, realizing what prayer ministry was, I literally thought to myself, you're praying, come Holy Spirit, but isn't the Holy Spirit already here? Like, isn't he already here, guys? And... And the answer is, of course he's already here. Of course the Holy Spirit's already here. Um, but I like to give this example um, where Wayne Morgan is here. And I was, I'm a freaking out because I just said his name. But I know Wayne Morgan. He's a good friend of mine. And if I was to have him come up and tell his story, he has one of the most profound radical stories 
that you'll hear. Like he literally goes on tour in the summer to give his story to camps everywhere around the country because his story is amazing. You should actually legitimately have coffee with him and hear his story. Um, I mean, you had cancer, I mean, you were like, what? I mean, tell, give, I didn't, I didn't mean, I, I said I wouldn't do this to you, but like okay, 10 seconds, give me a 10 second version of like the radicalness of your story. Uh, I had stage three high risk testicular cancer with uh, doctors in New York City said 40% chance of survival. And so, uh, and the doctor came in one day and goes, Mr. Morgan, your case has been proving to be interesting. I was like, well, there's a couple thousand people praying for me. And he says, well, whatever it is, it works. So, uh, so amazing, right? Like incredible story. Now here's the thing. Wayne Morgan has been present this whole time. It wasn't until I asked him to share his story that you were got to hear his story and probably were ministered to you like, whoa, that's incredible. I need more of that. Like what's going on there? When we pray come Holy Spirit, we're essentially handing over the mic and saying, okay, Holy Spirit, you do your thing now. Does that make sense? And then we pay attention and listen to what the Holy Spirit's doing and say yes and participate in it with Him. It wasn't until I said, hey Wayne, <laughs> tell your story man, 10 seconds. And he did it because he gives a story around the country. And it's an incredible story. It's ministering to you. When we pray, come Holy Spirit, yes, the Holy Spirit's here. Just like Wayne Morgan's been here the whole time. But it wasn't until I asked Wayne to share his story that all of a sudden you heard it. And it wasn't until we say, come Holy Spirit, you do your thing, that it, God is going to minister in really profound ways. Of course, the Holy Spirit's already doing things. Of course, like of course. But the intentionality of creating that space to hear from the Lord is different. And that's something we need to lean into. Um, and this isn't, of course, uh, Luke 11, 11 through 13. Jesus says, what father among you, if his son asks for a fish, will instead of a fish, give him a serpent? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those you ask Him? When we pray, come Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit always shows up and does incredible things. It doesn't look like, sometimes it looks like tears, sometimes it looks like rest, sometimes it looks different. Um, I've always found it to be very gentle. The Holy Spirit's very gentle. And so what we want to do, and the reason why I'm leaning into this a little bit, is because we want to create a space for you to be um, for us to pray over you and to wait on the Lord together um, and then for you to just maybe what does it look like for us to have a ministry of prayer even you don't have to follow this model it's just a simple model but what does it look like to have a ministry of prayer with your young people inviting them into it participating in it and relying on the Holy Spirit that he is going to do what he says he's going to do um, so I actually Bonnie do you want to come up and I'll let you kind of like close it out with this is that cool great cool